host, John Wood, and welcome back to Jay Wood Fly Fishing on YouTube. I am coming to you from here at the Jay Wood Fly Fishing headquarters in beautiful Billings, Montana. Today I want to do for you a fly that I call the Baby Ringo. This is a fly that was designed for fishing for bass and it's designed to imitate a crawfish. As such, I have uh, come up with a modeling coloration because the crayfish, if you look at them, they always have a lot of marks across their back on their claws and everything. So I have designed this so that it uh, has all that modeling in the coloration. And I used to tie these with brushes, but I found the brushes to be very time consuming. So what I'm using now is the same kind of fibers, these uh, Cascade Crest CCT fibers. They're really great. I love how slinky they are in the water. They've got some really good kink to them. So they tie in on the hook very securely and when you're fishing them, um, it's not so much an issue on this uh, fly where the uh, fibers are trimmed really short, but on bigger flies like the scimitar shrimp and the scimitar minnow, when these fibers get wet, if they get gnarled up when you catch a fish, all you've got to do is drop it in the water, give it a shake, falls cast it, and everything falls right back in place. I just really love these fibers. Now they're handled in a very particular way, so I'm going to show you that before we get started on this fly. But first I'm going to put the hook in the vise, and this hook is a Timco 8089, that's an 8089. Alternately, you can use the Umqua X series, these uh, XS420 in a size one aught is almost identical to this. It's just got a slightly wider gap. Uh, the hook shank's a tad longer, but the point ends up in the exact same spot. And that's pretty important on this fly because this fly is designed to be weedless and the fibers are what makes it that way. So the fibers, these CCT fibers, I'm going to use two separate bundles. One bundle will be just olive, and there's going to be five of these individual bundles, these small bundles. Uh, there's about 120 of these in each hank of CCT fibers, and each small little bundle is between six and seven inches. And it's bound with a single strand of the material, and it's called a binding wrap. And what it does is it keeps these little bundles together. And that's another thing that I really like about these fibers is that each bundle has the exact number of fibers. So whenever I build a fly, whether it be the scimitar minnow or shrimp, this uh, baby ringo or the boogie crab, I know how much fiber I'm using, so I know what the sink rate is going to be, whether it's going to sink fast or it's going to sink really slow. But I need to get that binding wrap off of there, so I'm going to use a um, grout brush. And you can pick this up at any home improvement store. Lowe's, Home Depot, Ace, any of those should have a grout brush. And it's just nylon bristles, and they're really stiff. Um, you can use a toothbrush, and I did before I started using this, but the bristles aren't quite stiff enough because what we're going to need to do is use this to brush that binding wrap off of that small bundle. And you can see this one here, that binding wrap is really tight. And I just take my time using my thumb as a backup on the fibers and brush that through there. And these bundles right here seem to have the binding wrap pretty tight. So I'm gonna use the alternate method, which actually is my preferred method, and that is I lay these fibers down on my pant leg, 
and brush them. And I'm not sure why, and I think it's because I've got a more solid uh, backing. It lets me brush those out in there without quite as much difficulty. So I brush it halfway, get half of it flattened out like a ribbon, and then I'm going to turn it around and brush the other end, starting right at the very end of the fibers, and you work your way back towards the center. Once you get to the center of that bundle, flip it over and brush the other end. So that's one bundle right there. And I, I want to open it up, gently open it up into a ribbon. And the reason I want this flat ribbon is because we're going to add some flash material to it here in just a minute. So that's bundle number one, which is going to be end up being called our sushi roll. I'm going to lay that down here on the table, nice and flat. And sorry, the camera angle is not right, so you can see that, but uh, I think you get the idea. Now our second bundle. I've already prepared one, so I'm not going to take the time to, to go, go through the brushing, but it consists of two olive fibers, one or two olive bundles, one red bundle, one purple bundle, and two fluorescent green bundles. And that's going to help us achieve our modeled coloration. And here's what that ribbon looks like once I get it all brushed out. Now this solid olive one, that's five small bundles, and the multicolored is six small bundles. Now for flash, you need to use something that's smooth because later on we're gonna groom the body of the fly. And if you use something like crystal flash, it's gonna get caught in your brush and cause a lot of problems. So I use a, uh, a material called crinkle flash. This is also from Cascade Crest Tools. It's a new age crinkle flash in midnight and it's got a lot of different colors. Now you see it does have some kinks in some of these uh, strands but that does not interfere with the combing like crystal flash does which has a twist. If your flash material has a twist, it's not going to work in this as easily. You're going to end up uh, kind of cursing yourself. But Flashaboo, um, this uh, Crinkle Flash, either one of those will work really well. It just needs to have a flat surface. Now I'm going to cut off about six, eight, ten strands. You don't need a whole lot. And I'm just going to lay those right on top of my olive ribbon of CCT fibers. I'm going to cut another bundle of strands and this I'm going to get a few more, uh, 10 to 12. And you can add more or less depending on how much flash you want on there. That's probably like more like about 15, but that's okay. This midnight uh, has got black, red, gold, silver, and then some just uh, UV strands in there. So I've laid the flash over the top of the CCT. And this is the part you're not going to be able to see this next step. What I'm going to do is turn that perpendicular to me, and I'm going to roll it like a sushi roll. And that's where calling this a sushi roll comes from. I've just rolled that flash material right into the middle of my CCT fibers. Now I'm going to do the multicolored one, which is purple, red, fluorescent green, and olive. And I'm going to sushi roll that baby up. There we go. I just rolled that up using the surface of the table. And you can see that flash in there. And it, right now you don't see it very well. It's in the trimming when that becomes more obvious. Now these are handled in three separate sections. 
So I'm going to take my scissors, which are tungsten scissors. You want to use tungsten when you're cutting flash and stuff like that because it'll wear out your uh, standard steel scissors a little bit faster. And I'm going to cut this at about 1 and 7 eighths inches long. I'm going to cut two of those. And then I'm going to end up with a third bundle that's about two and a half inches long. And we're going to do the same with our multicolored sushi roll. About one and seven eighths. One and seven eighths again. And then we end with a bundle, a section that's about two and a half inches. So now that we've got everything prepped, well, fibers at least, um, I'm also going to put legs on here, and I'm using uh, silly legs or crazy legs, it doesn't matter, uh, whatever you prefer, whatever you've got on hand. And in this one, I'm going to use a red flake and an olive with speckles in it. And I'm going to use two legs on each side. I'm going to go ahead and cut those loose, and then separate each individual leg and I just either pop that off where they come together or cut it. So I've got my two olive speckles and then I'll take my uh, red and do the same thing. I'm going to separate them out with that Got a little static here in the air because it's kind of dry today. So now I'm going to have two pairs, one red, one olive. And those will come in towards the middle of the fly. The next thing I've got here is um, zonker strip in olive variant. And I should have had one of these cut, but I did not. So, I'll just take you through that process. I like to keep these on the card if they come on a card, um, just for ease of handling, and it keeps them nice and straight. Um, a couple of the brands, they just come in a bag, and the leather tends to get kinked up. But I like to have it nice and flat, so I leave them on there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and measure along the leather side of that, and use a razor blade to cut it. I will make a little mark here at two inches and then show you how to cut that so you don't cut the fur off while you're cutting the leather. So there's my mark. If you take your scissors and just cut it right here, you're going to cut the tip of the hair from the next strip and that's going to kind of waste that a little bit. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use my razor blade, lay it right there on the mark like that, put a little pressure on it and pull. And when you do that with the pressure and the pull at the same time, it cuts it. But when you're pulling that away, it makes it so that you don't cut the hair off the end of your strip and so you haven't wasted any. I'll put that aside and for controlling things like marabou and rabbit like that I keep this little sponge cloth around nice and wet and you just run it across that and it controls the hair. Now what I want to do here is I'm going to cut about a quarter inch of the hair, fur, whatever you want to call it, off of the leather. And that's going to do two things. One, I'm using that as a marker for positioning. And the other thing is, with this hair cut off of here, when a fish pulls on that, if it bites it by the tail or you tug on it when you're trying to get it out of a fish's mouth, it's going to keep it from sliding. 
with that hair is stacked on there and you leave it on you can see it makes for a surface where everything until it gets rebound it's going to move but with that like that and you've just got those little stubs on there it's going to lock in place really really well and let's see the last material natural material that we want to prep is going to be a feather but i'll uh, marabou feather but i'll do that when we get to it all right now let's get started with the hook in the vise Again, this is a TMCO 8089. Uh, alternately, you can use the XS420. It's a heavier hook, um, but I really like this one. It's done really well for me. It's ultra sharp. It's got a fine barb on it. So we start the thread right behind the eye of the hook, and I'm going to come right to where I'm not quite to the point of the hook pretty close you can see my thread hanging down there that's just a spiral wrap and then wrap right up behind the eye of the hook then I'm going to go back about one hook eye length and I'm going to leave that just a couple layers of thread or three layers of thread and then I'm going to go back about another eye length to two eye lengths more and build a heavy thread base that's thick and I want eight or ten layers of thread on there and what that's going to do is it's going to help to lock our eyes down when we put them on there and the eyes on this fly are just brass hourglass eyes in black these are 3 16 or 4.5 millimeter. Now to get those started on there, I'm just going to loop around there once, going in one direction, and then I'm going to make two more loops on there, going in the same direction. Then I'm going to come under my hook shank and make several wraps going the other direction. So what we've done is we've crisscrossed uh, this way for a few wraps and then we crisscross that way for a few wraps. And I'm going to keep doing that three or four wraps each way alternating several times and then I'm going to take my thread and go between the eyes and the shank of the hook. And that's going to gather those wraps on the bottom side of the eyes and lock it down even more. Do my crisscross one more time and then do the wrap between the eyes and the shank one more time. And those are locked on there. You have to really struggle to get those to move. So make sure they're in position before you do all of that wrapping. Now I'm going to drop that back about quarter of an inch. Now I'm going to add a little extra weight and this is also going to give me a marker for where the materials go. And I'm going to use a product called Channel Lead. It's also a Cascade Crest Tools product and this is the size medium. Comes in a little spool like this in your Ziploc bag. And I'm going to use my tungsten scissors and cut um, one half inch length. Snip that off of there. And then I'm going to take and turn the channel down and slide it right on to the hook. Use my fingernail and press it down in place. And I'm about in the middle, so I'm going to wrap my thread around that really snug and right up there behind the eyes I want to make sure it's down all the way make sure it's down back here you can kind of pinch that in if you want not necessary um, and then just wrap and cover it really really solid now right here at the back I want to just build a little tapered thread dam 
just to make sure if one of my materials falls off there it's not going to cause it to flop off that sharp edge. Now I'm going to come back not quite a quarter of an inch go forward off the back end of that lead and I'm going to lay this zonker strip on here where the hair that we left on there starts I want that to be right at the back end of the lead. I'm going to pinch that in place make a few wraps make sure it's right squarely up on top and then secure it down very tightly and you can lift that up and see where you're at. I don't want to walk off the end of that. And the reason I'm being fairly precise about that is because when we start stacking our CCT fibers on there, I want them, everything to fill up this remaining space completely with no gaps and I don't want it crowded in there either. So once I get that on there, I'm going to take a piece of UV copper polar chenille and I'm going to tie it on to the top of the hook shank let me clip that in that's a little gnarly right there so that the fibers the actual flash fibers are pointing down they're on the bottom side of the core and they're pointing backwards and what that's going to do for me is when I make the five wraps on here, the uh, fibers are going to be radiating straight out away from the hook shank as opposed to laying down flat. And I want them to kind of be uh, outward so that they will work their way through the marabou that we're going to wrap over there. And again, I want five wraps. That's three, four, and five. I believe that's right. And my thread is a little bit forward, so I'm going to unwrap that. And I want to drop it right over the top of the core just once really snug work everything back and then make several wraps right there and then lock it in until we clip that and I'll pull the long fibers back and you can see the core poking out there above my thread and I'm going to bind that down really well all of it and we're going to kind of build a little taper because this drops us off the front end of our leather strip on the zonker just a little bit of a taper there all right now I want to be right in front of that now to prepare our marabou feather and this is just your regular run-of-the-bill marabou feather and when you hold it, you'll see that one side has a concave, and I want that concave down. This way, you can, uh, I don't know if you can see it there, but the center um, of the barbs, they kind of point upward. I want those pointing down, and then I'm going to point them away from myself. And I grab this by the very tip, and then lightly stroke those down. Don't get too rough with it. You don't want to peel them off of the center quill and I'm going to prep that about like we would a soft tackle and that's what I've got right there and I want to cut this tip off that is discarded now again with the concave down I'm going to come back here a ways to where I'm catching three four or five pairs of barbs in there with the center quill and what that does is it makes this tie-in point a lot more durable you'll be surprised how much more durable those few barbs will make this tie-in point and it keeps it from 
um, coming loose when you're fishing it and even more aggravatingly when you're trying to tie it on. So I'm only going to use about six wraps. So I'm going to strip a little bit, a few more of these barbs off the bottom of that. And it takes about two and a half to three inches. Get a little moisture off of my sponge cloth and just brush those back. I don't want them wet. I just want them damp so they're not flying here in this dry air we've got here in Billings. It's winter time and things are quite dry here. So that moisture helps to contain those barbs. And again, not a whole lot, just damp. You don't want them soaked. You don't want them wet. They will tend to mat and we're gonna groom them out here in just a minute. Uh, that got caught, so let me do that again. There we go, a little better. And I lost count, but that's about the amount of bulk that I want. I don't want a ton of bulk. And grab that stem with what's normally my bobbin hand, hold it tight, and then get one really super secure wrap of thread on there. And I can bring my left hand back here over the barbs and really crank that down. And I want that stem to be right on top of the hook shank, and I'm going to bring it a ways forward, make sure that it is completely locked down, and then clip it off. Now I'm going to take a eyebrow mustache comb brush, and I'm going to use the comb side, and get everything to direction that I'm going. And it's still nice and dry, and I don't want that in the way, and that marabou tends to get in the way at this point. So I'm going to take my sponge cloth, and it's pretty damp, and at this point, I can put quite a bit of moisture on there and I'm not going to cause any problem. But everything is going to be nice and contained. There we go. Now everything is out of the way for the attachment of our legs. Again, this is two pairs of rubber legs. One is a red with blue flakes in it and the other one is an olive with darker flakes in it. You can use whatever colors you've got on hand. Mostly we're just looking for a small flash of color and movement. Now I want to make sure my thread is right up against the marabou. Yeah, I've evened up the ends of these two legs and they're going to go on my side of the hook. I'm going to even them up pretty good. They don't have to be exact. Grab the tips. Hold my bobbin and I can raise it up and then let those legs slide around to my side of the hook. I'm going to let that go and show you where those are sitting right on the very side of the shank, right in the middle. Give it a couple more wraps to lock them down and we're going to repeat the process with two more legs on the other side of the hook. Now, if you feel like you want to add more legs, go right ahead. It's not going to affect the way this fly fishes at all. But I do think that these make a difference. When I started adding legs as opposed to not having legs, uh, my strike rate went up quite a bit. So now I've locked those down and they're on the opposite side of the hook. Wrapped in there with a fairly good footprint. And now I'm going to bend those legs that were shooting forward backwards and then wrap right up onto the ends. Not a lot, just right on the ends of the fold. And that's going to give me a little bump here that we're going to use to stack our fibers against. And that bump right there is really nice. So, 
we've got our legs and our tail and our marabou collar on there and I'm going to invert this fly in the vise and I want it to have a pretty good upward tilt you can see there lock that in and to keep everything out of the way while we're stacking our fibers I'm going to take a twist tie and this is a heavy duty twist tie off of an electrical cord pull everything back and just wrap this thing around there so I've got like one and a half full wraps and then bend the ends back over the jaws of my vise and that's going to hold everything neatly out of the way now we're going to be pulling those fibers back so to protect my fingers I have taken uh, this is the uh, guard off the end of a pair of scissors and I shot just a little bit like one medium sized drop of solar res flex resin down in there and then set it and the flex resin allows me to shove that thing on there and hold it in place before I put that flex resin in there it would fall off while I was tying and then I'd end up jamming my fingers now I don't need my scissors at this point so I'm going to set them down and we're going to pick up the longest section of multicolored sushi roll and you can see I've flattened it down to where it's kind of a ribbon we're going to lay that ribbon with the center point right over where our thread is hanging right down on top of the hook and then make a couple of loose wraps and check that it's on the upper portion of the hook and across the top we don't want it on the belly it's great we want it to go all the way down the side but I don't want it on the belly I'm going to roll that around real slow so you can see where everything's at I'm going to get a couple more wraps back towards where the legs are tied in. And then I'm going to take this front portion and fan it out. The back portion, I want it to stay gathered. And then the front portion, I'm going to fold it back. And it's just a little bit in the center. But most of it's going to be on the sides of that rear portion. Of this bundle and then I built a little thread down there now I'm going to take the long olive sushi roll and do the exact same thing I've got it flattened out and I can position my flash in there however I want whether I want it to the center or to the sides and I I like to kind of keep it towards the center as I tie it in and then I can control where it goes when I fold it and it's exactly the same thing I want the rear portion to be the center of this layer and the front portion to be the sides of this layer and you can see by doing that I get a little bit of flash on the sides and a little bit of flash in the middle Pull that back. I'm going to put a little moisture on my fingers there to help me get a grip. Again, it's really dry here. And I'm going to fill that gap. And those thread wraps pushing back against that are stacked against the next layer of fibers and thread wraps and the next layer of fiber and thread wraps. And it really locks this stuff in. Now that I've got that in there, I'm going to take another one of the shorter sections of the multicolored sushi roll drop that down in there loosely lock it in place make sure it's positioned where I want fan out the front get a couple more wraps going back fold that front section backwards pull on it really tight and fill that gap in the fold I hope you can see that and now I'm going to do that with the a short section of the olive 
and it's just the same process repeated all the way up behind the eyes it doesn't take a ton of wraps but you do want to get enough so that when you pull on it you can feel how locked in those fibers are now once I've filled that gap I'm going to drop my thread up here in front of the eyes go all the way to the eye of the hook and then back right up next to the eyes I've got one last section of multicolored sushi roll and one last section of olive and I'm going to treat them the same way we did on the back side of the eyes the only difference is once you get up here and you don't have as much materials around the shank of the hook it wants to try to walk around the hook so be conscious of that and make sure that you reposition it get it right up on top before you lock everything in place and again I'm working backwards on that and having the, the hook shank tilted upward towards the eye helps with that and this I want to flare it out really good you got to kind of work it to get it flared down around those eyes fill up my gap and then this is our last little bundle right here get that in there again it wants to walk around so I want to make sure that everything's on top and you can do that by pulling upward or outward don't pull forward because you will pull those out at this point until you get them really locked down just pull upward or to the side so that's locked down and now I'll lock that in and fill that gap and I'm filling that gap completely before I whip finish it with my little midge whip finisher from TMCO. I love this thing because it uh, uses far less thread than a larger whip finisher. We'll clip that off. And get everything out of the way that I don't need and do the trimming. Okay, to do the trimming, I'm going to use three things. My tungsten scissors. I always want to use tungsten when trimming these fibers because even these expensive, like Dr. Slick scissors, they tend to dull just a little bit quicker with all the synthetics in there. Um, I've got some uh, inexpensive tungstens, and I like these for their toughness, but as you can see, the blades are a little thick and it tends to not trim this as well as these Dr. Slicks which have the very thin blades and then um, the last thing we're going to use as part of our trimming is a half of a safety razor and I keep that in that paper until I use it and I'll show you how I handle that when we get to that point. First thing I want to do is get my guard off of here. We don't need that anymore. Put it someplace where you're not going to lose it. It's kind of small and tends to uh, disappear at the least opportune moment. Now you can see I'm brushing this out and if I had used crystal flash in there what would happen is because it's it's uh, twisted during the manufacturing is it would furl back on itself and it causes a lot of matting of the CCT fibers it just uh, it's kind of a nightmare it just doesn't work out and you can see the way this one came out we got a lot of flash right in the middle of that fly now I'm cutting this way and if I try to cut like this the fibers are just going to slide out of my scissors so what I'm going to do is take this out sorry about that noise take my uh, twist tie off of there and I'm going to put the eye of the hook 
in the box. Right there. Now I've got this catch basket on here. It's a hairline waste basket. I love this thing, especially for processes like this where I'm cutting a bunch of materials and I don't want them just flying around on the floor. So I'm going to try to do most of my cutting at this point without turning the fly upside down. And the reason is I've got my legs that will fall through everything and they're real easy to cut. And I haven't figured out a really good way how to uh, contain these things during this process. So I just uh, do the next best thing and let gravity take care of it and keep them out of my way. So I'm going to brush this out and back away from the center of the hook, away from the hook shank. And then take my scissors and start trimming to a taper and I want that taper to be small in the front large in the back and that does two things for me for this fly number one is it that's part of the reason it's so weedless is because it wedges through things and the taller fibers in the back tend to bounce it off of uh, limbs brush weeds those kinds of things. Now you can get this, this fly hung up. Um, I have found though that it, it fishes much more weedless. The slower you fish it, the more weedless it is. Uh, I believe, and I haven't gotten down in the water with it, but I believe when you start fishing it faster, it's going to have a tendency to roll. But if you just slowly bounce this through tin, timber and weeds, um, I have had one of these flies that I fished for an entire season almost before it, I got hung up to the point where I couldn't get it loose. Now I've got an overall taper. I'm going to brush some of this stuff out. Just get a better look at it. I'm liking it. I'm liking the flash in the middle. Let's get a little bit more taper to it. I hope you can see this as I'm doing this. I know some of those fibers are getting in the way. And I want the back really long, and that shows you why I wanted that uh, one segment of that sushi roll to be considerably longer than the other two, because I want a lot of fibers towards the back. It just adds to the motion in the water. I fished these a lot in the beginning when I first designed it with a, a shorter head and it just didn't have the kind of action in the water that I wanted and I believe what happened is with this uh, shrouding the marabou up front as you pull this through the water it creates almost like a vortex back here like an eddy back behind the CCT fibers and that adds to the motion of the CCT fibers as well as the marabou. Alright, now I've got that trimmed down about as far as I want to go from this direction and I'm going to show you one of the best $20 bills I ever spent for fly tying and that's this Black & Decker uh, Dust Buster. 20 bucks, rechargeable. Once you get it charged up, it lasts forever. And it really helps to contain the fibers. On something like this, you'll get those fibers embedded down in there, and I found sucking them out with that dust buster is the best way to get them clean that way. Especially if you're going to take photographs of things like I do. You set it down on a black background. You don't have all these little... Uh, bits of fiber getting into the photograph making it difficult so I'm going to turn this over now and show you the razor blade portion of our program here and you see that the very front of the head is really rough right now uh, at least I can see it from this angle so what I do is I've got these 
razor blades. I just buy these in bulk. They're not expensive razor blades. It's just a cheap safety razor. With it still in the paper, fold it in the middle, and I'm using my finger there to fold it, and just snap it right in half. And when you do that, you will get two halves like I've got in this one that's already broken open. And I've got one down here that I've been using. So what you want to be real careful of when you're using this razor blade is never, ever, ever, ever grab it like that. Uh, it's a razor blade. It's going to cut you. Always grab it by the ends and keep your fingers back behind it. I like to use this little notch right here in the center for my index finger. Use my thumb on one end, my second finger on the other, and that way I've got complete control of that razor blade. I also keep a small magnet. It's just a little disc magnet. I believe it's a little rarer thing. On my vice base, so that I can keep my razor blade contained because I don't want it floating around and cutting other things up. So now I'm going to curve this like this and I'm just going to take that and being again very very careful I'm going to nip that back. All those little stubs that were fighting me with the scissors. I can just run that over there real nice and easily and you see the angle I've got it pointed downward towards the fibers and you can't put a lot of pressure on there because those fibers just drop right down into the the hook gap which is a good thing because that's what allows you to hook the fish and you'll notice the further I get back and when you start cutting these um, the less resistance you have on those fibers. There is just enough resistance to push the fly to the side away from a snag when it's swimming through the water. And, but there's enough lack of resistance with those fibers that you should not have any trouble hooking fish with this fly. Um, I was using a smaller hook when I first started fishing it and I thought it was the fibers. I made all kinds of changes, just kept making changes, kept making changes, and then I finally realized it was the size of the hook. Um, and when I went to the size, which is equivalent to a one aught, this 8089 number six is about like a one aught. Um, and then I started getting a hookup rate that I was really happy with and it's actually been about 95 to 98 percent and I think those lower percentages where I'm not hooking up are nothing more than operator error. I'm just not getting the strike fast enough because those bass tend to grab a, a bait and spit it out. They're tasting it. Um, I was able to fish this in a very very clear pond many many times and I'd watch those fish swim up to it really fast really aggressively suck it in and spit it out two or three times and that's the ticks that you feel and the little taps that you see in your line when you're fishing it but there we have the baby ringo now you can keep trimming on this thing if you want you can trim off the ends of the legs if you want them to be completely even but this one right here i really like the shape of this thing and i'm going to pull it out of here i'm going to give it one more cleaning and then hold it and let you see the shape it's just a kind of a, a tapered cone in every direction and you can trim this smaller if you want I'm going to get a little bit of that off of there and you'll get a slightly faster sink rate you can also add a, a larger weight you can actually wrap lead wire around there if you want to I find it more time consuming than the channel lead 
which is why I went to the channel lid. Um, or you can use the large channel lid, but it is big and it will make that fly sink super, super fast. But there you have it. There's the baby Ringo. And you can see the mottled coloration on there. You can see how that would imitate a crawfish and take the place of the dreaded jig and pig lure used by conventional bass fishermen. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you tie a few of these things up, fish them, see how you like them, make your adjustments in weight, color, size, and uh, just use them and catch a few fish. They're, it's a very effective fly, and I think you'll be very happy with it. So until next time, love and fly fishing, my friends.